Well, our focus today from the scriptures is uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. Uh, if you're using the church Bible to follow along, just these two brief verses, um, they're very packed. Um, it's a, these two verses really function as the thesis statement, if you will, for the, the entirety of the book of Romans, which I've preached before. But let's just give our attention to the Word of God. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. If you're following along in the church Bible, 939, you'll find it there. Let's hear the word of the Lord. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Would you bow with me as we pray in preparation? Father, we know that our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. And we also know that the hunger of our souls can only be satisfied by your word. So we pray, Father, that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to respond in faith to what you want us to hear. And I pray that By your grace, you would cause us to be conformed to the image of your Son. That's what we want to happen today. The Lord is the one who is called to proclaim this truth. I pray that you would strengthen me, give me utterance that is seasoned by your grace, so that as a result, your people may be edified and that Christ would be glorified among us. And it's in his name we pray it. Amen. Well, this morning we're returning to our series of messages on the five solas. Five solas. uh, Solas alone simply means alone in Latin. This week we're going to consider sola fide. That means faith alone. That is really part of a larger statement containing five core doctrinal phrases, I guess, if you will, that are really at the heart of what it means to be evangelical in the historical sense. And and the statement is this. Scripture alone, that's the first message we did. Scripture alone reveals that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, that's where we are today, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Now, there are a lot of churches that would affirm this, and certainly in this community and and around the world. And So I'm not saying that we're alone in this. Uh, My my reason for doing this series is, is so that we would not be pulled away because there's a, uh, a temptation among churches to, to accommodate to what the world wants. And I'm no prophet. I, I'm not saying that I, I know how the future is going to unfold, but I've just got this sense that, that what's pressing in on the church is uh, we're, we're easily distracted by it. And, and some of the freedoms that we've enjoyed, especially in this nation, to, to boldly... Uh, preach what is in the Word of God. Those things are being challenged. And, and at the highest levels of government, uh, it's, it's a subtle, maybe even a passive form of, of persecution to get us as the church to accommodate. And so the example would be from the inauguration. Was that this last week? The, yes, I think it was this last week. President uh, Obama's uh, inauguration for a second term. So he took an oath of office. And as you know, it ends, so help me God. I think it did. I didn't actually watch it. But he said that. I'm pretty sure he said, so help me God at the end, with his hand on a couple of Bibles, one from, I think, Lincoln and Martin Luther King Jr. Anyway, he had those Bibles saying, so help me God, even while in advance of the whole event, uh, there had been a pastor invited to give a benediction, Lou Lou Giglio, I think his name is, and uh, he was invited and then uninvited or he withdrew, but it's still hazy as to what happened, but somebody looked back in the history of of his preaching, and he had preached a sermon about how homosexuality was uh, a sin. And he said, God's design for people, this isn't it, and uh, God wants to free you from that, as well as all kinds of other sexual sins that would would, uh, bind you and and, and keep you bound and uh, away from God. And I don't know the the sum of his message, but they felt that that was politically incorrect, and and he he withdrew as a result of all of the pressure, because they called him a bigot. Now, this, is, this has been preached for 2,000 years, and the Word of God we've, we've stood on. But there's this kind of persecution that happens when, when Christians are being asked to compromise for the sake of what the world wants. We have this sola statement, which I just read to you. If Satan himself were allowed to, to define that, 
Here's, here's how he would put it. If he were to put this kind of statement maybe into the government's hands today, it would go something like this. We believe that consensus reveals that we are saved by trusting whatever higher power you choose for your own self-fulfillment. I think that's what Satan would write. I think many in the world would like to have a statement like that because it's very inclusive, isn't it? And that may seem to you absurd, but I assure you that some of these sentiments in my heretical statement right there, some of these things have crept into the belief systems and the practices of local churches. Many churches with whom we share a heritage in the Protestant Reformation. So don't be fooled, this stuff is happening. Many have been pulled away. And I think you'd agree that we don't want that to happen to us. And so giving attention to these solas is a, is a way of, of getting us grounded back in what's important. Now, in the past weeks, we dealt, like I said, with Scripture alone as the foundation for what we believe. Everything's grounded on that. That's the anchor point. And then we considered that the reason we are saved is that God is gracious towards us. God's grace stands alone with no reason in us or no assistance in us needed for God to act graciously. Now, that brings me to today, considering faith alone. Faith alone. So what does that have to do? Because it's kind of closely linked. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. They're all kind of melded together, aren't they? Well, here's, here's what this answers, the, the question that this answers. How should we respond to God's grace? How should we respond to God's grace? Now, I think when we truly appreciate the, the magnitude of the grace of God, when the Holy Spirit opens our minds and our hearts to, to understand the immeasurable love that God has for us, to cover our sin to take it off of us completely and to put it on Jesus the Son. I think, and at least when we think about this, it's almost natural to, to respond in faith, isn't it? So here's a kind of a, a say, statement that, that ties um, some of these solas together. Grace is the reason for and precedes faith. It's before faith. Grace is the reason for and precedes faith. And Christ is the foundation for and the expression of God's grace. So, while grace alone explains to us why God saves, faith alone describes the only acceptable response on our part to God's grace. So, what is faith? As we begin to unpack this. The word faith uh, is, synonymous words I guess would be belief or trust. So when you have faith in someone, you believe them or you trust them. And of course, we also have to understand that faith isn't just a religious word, even though it, it is included in, in our language. But it's something that everyone exercises all the time. We always exercise faith. We have to every single day. You use faith when you make a lunch appointment with someone and you show up at the restaurant with the expectation that the other, uh, that the other person will be there. You went there having faith. You trusted that person would be true to his or her word. We use faith all the time. Now, when we're talking about faith in a biblical sense, when we say faith alone, we need to understand that it's faith in the right object. And I'll, I'll explain this a little bit as we're going along. So, just to be clear here, we're not talking about faith like it's some independent power source that we use to make things happen. That's not what we're talking about. And, I, you know, we... When people are interviewed, maybe famous people on TV, or, or you know, I, I was thinking of how many times has Barbara Walters interviewed somebody in 2020. You know, she might have a person there who's endured some uh, difficult circumstance, some great loss, devastating financial or personal loss, and she might ask how they endured it. And, and I'm just making this up, but I've heard these things. person might respond, well, I just had to keep my faith. Now, they, in that conversation, don't make clear what the object of faith is, but... Sometimes what they just mean is you have to believe in that everything will just work out fine in the end. Okay? Some people approach faith that way. And that's not what we're talking about because that kind of faith is faith in faith. And that's not biblical faith. That's not what we're saying when we say faith alone. Now let's get to unpacking this. Enough introduction. Here's my first uh, observation point. And I've got three, as is my custom. All right, the first one. We'll get right to it. Is salvation is for believers. Salvation is for believers. Now look in verse 16. It says, It, that is the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Salvation, you can take out the middle, 
even though it applies, it modifies it. Salvation is for everyone who believes. Then he says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So quite obviously, anyone who believes is another way of saying one who has faith or anyone who has faith. Now, we look at this and I've dealt with this before, but to the Jew and also to the Greek, first to the Jew and also to the Greek, um, just understand this. The, the priority here for the Jews is chronological and not preferential. So let me just get that out. It's chronological, not preferential. Because salvation uh, is from the Jews, as Jesus said in John 4.22. This is really a side note, but I don't want us to get stuck on the fact that he says it's to the Jew first, as if the Jews are more important to be saved than the Gentiles. Because the Jews and the Greeks, Greeks includes all of the rest of civilization, uh, and non-civilization for that matter. And really what this says is to the whole world, The gospel came to the Jews first through Jesus and extends to everyone. But here's the point. It's not that God wanted to save the Jews more than the Gentiles. Okay? And salvation is not for everyone only who is a Jew. It is not for everyone who had necessarily a moral upbringing. It's not for everyone born in a better place or in a better family. No, what we're to understand is salvation is for everyone who believes. That's so important. Belief, faith. Now, Jews and Gentiles alike, all of us are included in this. We need salvation, of course, because we're all born in sin and that sinful nature has the effect of separating us from God, a God who is holy, a God who must act according to his holiness. He must act justly towards sin. And if God should act justly towards his sin, then he must act justly towards those whom sin is on. Yet God can also choose to act mercifully. And we do have this in the scriptures. God who is rich in mercy can and does choose to be merciful even while we were still sinners. And so he intervened in our lives and showed his grace in the very message of the gospel. Salvation is for those who have faith. We read in Acts 16, the story there is about Paul and Silas. They did, they'd been imprisoned, if you know the story. They had been falsely accused of stirring up the, the city in Philippi. Well, they were put in shackles and put into the inner part of the prison. And all night long, they were singing hymns of praise and they were testifying with their songs to Christ. And I don't have any doubt that the jailer who, had, who was guard, uh, charged with guarding them had heard them, had heard them singing thinking that they were being ridiculous. But then suddenly there's this earthquake. Their shackles fall off of them. Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas are freed. And the jailer runs in as his heart's awakened by the truth of what these men are singing about. And it tells us in Acts 16, and the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, this is desperate, right? Because he's, he's confronted with this This amazing thing, the reality, the truth of what they've been singing. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and your household. He asked, what must I do? A lot of people ask that question. But Paul and Silas, what did they answer? They didn't give him a task. They told him that he needed to believe, to believe in Jesus. And so the jailer was saved through faith. The power of the gospel is put on display when there's faith. That's what happens. The power of the gospel, this is true in your life. When you have faith, the power of the gospel is put on display. And when there is genuine faith, it means that God has acted in advance. The necessary precondition to faith is God giving new birth, causing that individual to be born again as we talked about in the grace alone message. So, We might ask though, why is it that there are some who don't believe if the gospel has power for salvation? Why is it that, that people can hear the same message about Christ and one will believe and the other may not? We certainly cannot conclude that the message itself lacks power. We don't want to make that conclusion. It's just that it it is effectual for those whom God has appointed to eternal life. Again, in the book of Acts, Acts 13.48, it says this. Paul had been preaching at Antioch. Here's a description of what happened there in Antioch. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed 
They believed because God had appointed, had decided, had chosen that they would believe. Yet to be saved, they had to have faith. If there was no faith, zero faith, there would be no evidence of grace. And the gospel to them falls on a hard beaten path or deaf ears or stony hearts. But we must not fall into the trap as either of thinking that faith is some kind of button that pushes God to do something. It moves him somehow to save us. However, when you have faith, God is delighted. Hebrews tells us that we are saved through faith alone because faith is actually what pleases God. Hebrews 11.6, And without faith it is impossible to please Him. So the converse must be true. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. So listen, you can be sure of this. You can be absolutely sure of this. If God is pleased with you, if God is pleased with you, it is not because you have tried hard to be good. Now that may assault your thinking, but that's, if God is pleased with you, it's not because you tried hard to be good. If God is pleased with you, it is not because you're a, of a particular race of people. If God is pleased with you, listen, it is not because you can memorize scripture or get up early to pray or give to charity or even sacrifice your very life. If God is pleased with you, it's not because of those things. No, in fact, the only reason for God to be pleased with you is that you have faith in Jesus, the Son. And through faith, God then gives you the reward of being counted in Christ so that all of His merits are counted to you. And it is the merit of Christ, the goodness of the Lord Jesus, that gets counted to you through faith that brings God delight. God is pleased when you have faith. All right, now to the second observation from this text in Romans, and it is this. I'll just state it outright. The gospel evokes faith. The gospel evokes faith. This point answers the question, how do we come to have faith? What happens that causes faith to be birthed in us? And the answer is, it comes from hearing the gospel. It comes from hearing the gospel. Now, we use the word gospel a lot here. I use it all the time. It permeates almost every message that I've ever preached. We, we say that a lot here because Jesus and the apostles, from their preaching, we, we learned that it really stands at, at the, the central theme of all of God's revelation. Now, most of you already know this, but I'm... I'm going to say it anyway for anyone who might be in the room who may be unsure of what, what gospel means. So listen, here's my, here's my summary. The word gospel. Gospel is Bible shorthand, okay? It's Bible shorthand for this. The good news about Jesus, that he is the eternal son of God in human flesh, that he was conceived in a virgin and then born, and that as he lived, he lived in sinless perfection, before God and man, that he was crucified in our place, taking upon himself our sins, that he arose from the grave three days later, that he appeared to his disciples and many others over a period of 40 days, and then that he ascended to his rightful throne at God the Father's right hand, where he right now intercedes for us and reigns over all creation. That's the gospel. And if you believe this, you will be saved. That's what the scripture says. Now, my point here in saying that the gospel evokes faith is that if salvation is through faith alone, that faith needs a correct object. Like I said, it's just not faith that everything will work out in the end. It's not some kind of ethereal hope that everything will be in my favor. Now, faith with a correct object, faith alone is much more precise. And that is why the gospel is absolutely crucial to faith alone. And that's what this verse tells us, right? Now, there, there are a lot of people, and we, we know some of these people, and I've met people. There are a lot of people that they say they believe in God. 
They say they believe in God, yet that faith may not save them. I say may not. I don't know. The Lord knows. And perhaps, it is possible, perhaps some here this morning have that kind of faith. Faith that will not save you, yet faith that somehow believes in God. The Jesus himself in scripture gave an example of these kinds of people. He said that there would be many, many who called him Lord, Lord. They would come before him at the judgment. They would say, Lord, Lord, here are all the things that I've done to you. Done to you, done for you. To which Jesus said he would respond very directly. Depart from me, I never knew you. Now why would Jesus do that? You know, on the surface when you read that, it just kind of seems cruel and arbitrary, right? But it's not. We have to get this in us. Jesus is revealing in this very teaching that, that we don't come to him on our own terms or based on a false conception of him. That's why the gospel must be central. And I'll illustrate this way. You'll see the absurdity of it, I hope. Imagine you make a new friend and you, you tell that person about what's important to you. And you know, you meet somebody new, you share life and you talk. You tell them about your wife. You tell them about the reasons you love her. <laughs> First conversation, I know, it's probably too much information, but just go with me, okay? But anyway, imagine that this happens. You tell about your wife, how she cares for you, your family, maybe her interests, something about her family history, whatever. I mean, stuff comes up in conversation, right? Well then, for some reason, at an opportunity in the future, you invite this friend over for dinner and he has an opportunity to meet your wife. Well, he comes into the house and then he begins recounting to her what he thinks he knows about her. And then he says something like this, oh yes, I know about you, you're from Germany originally. But then your wife says, no, I'm from Montreal actually. And then he says, Yes, and, and your father was a pilot for, for Lufthansa. He said, no, he was in advertising. And then he, more of this stuff, and then you can't take it anymore, so you intervene. Go, this is a strange conversation. Why are you saying these things? None of this is true. I didn't tell you that. And your friend says this. Well, that's just the way I like to think about her. Now, have you said that? You think he's surely insane. Who would do that? But guess what? People do this all the time with God. They have faith in a God conjured up in their own minds, in their own imaginations. They say things like this, I like to think of God or Jesus as. Fill in the blank. Don't people do that all the time? And they supply this concoction that's pure fiction. Now, that's why it says in verse 16 here, that the gospel, the gospel, all that stuff I told you, the good news about Jesus Christ, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And we've got to get this. It's not just that the gospel is helpful. It is essential. That's the reason it is the power. Not a power. It is the power for salvation. And it is faith in that that saves. And any faith that is not grounded in the gospel is empty and will not save. We've got to be clear on that. That's why I say the gospel evokes faith. If there's no gospel, there's no foundation for faith. Therefore, there can be no saving faith. And where there is no faith in the right object, there is no salvation. Even, even if the, peop the person who has this faith is very sincere. It is so very tragic. But that there are a lot of sincere people who are going to be in hell because they were sincerely wrong and had their own invention of God and Christ, and they've ignored the gospel. That's why Paul so stridently, if you will, reminds Timothy about that power. This is in 2 Timothy. But he, he reminds him how, he reminds Timothy how he came to faith. He said this, because he wanted him to be faithful to preach it. He said this, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how, from childhood, here it is, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation. How? Through faith in Christ Jesus. Able to make you wise for salvation is another way of saying God's power for salvation. The sacred writings, the gospel. Now considering all of this, how, how this worked in us and how it will work in anyone. Listen, burn this into your thinking. The gospel, the message about Jesus must be told. It has to be. A genuine response of faith brings salvation. And rejection of that same message brings condemnation. There's no, 
middle ground. It is really that simple. And there are no substitutes for the gospel. If we're going to have faith, it must be grounded in the gospel. There are no substitutes, even though we're tempted to introduce them. And let me just give you some examples. And I've been guilty of these things too, thinking that somehow this will win people over. Disproving evolution and someone's faith in the facts of creation will not be enough to save them. Disproving evolution and and faith in the facts of creation will not be enough to save them. The discovery, I'm just making stuff up now. The discovery in Ararat of gopher wood planks smeared in pitch with Noah was here, carved into it, may convince someone about the historicity of a flood. But that alone will not be enough to save them. Someone believing, generally, certain facts about the Bible from the archaeological record will not be enough. Finding the Ark of the Covenant somewhere in Ethiopia and someone believing that this is a true artifact won't save them. And for you philosophers, the ontological, cosmological, teleological argument for the existence of God will alone not be convincing. You doing miracles, that will certainly amaze people, but that won't save them. Even raising the dead will not be enough. And who said that? Jesus. Even if somebody comes back from the dead, they will not believe it if they don't believe what the word of God says. Now hear me on this. Even your morally upright, pristine life will not be enough. Here's what I mean. Don't think this. I will win them over with my life. Many have said that. It won't work. Absent the gospel, faith needs to be grounded not in you, in your performance, or in archaeology, or in philosophical arguments, but in the gospel. Why? Romans 10, 17, Paul says this, faith comes from hearing, hearing through the word of Christ. What's the word of Christ? It's the gospel. You are not the gospel. I am not the gospel. Your life and my life does not evoke faith in someone. Faith comes from hearing the gospel. Well, if I asked you, as I move to the third point here, if I asked you what difference does faith make in your life, what would you say? We all have some kinds of thoughts around this. Now, I know certainly many among us would would point to an eternal hope that we have because We have been counted righteous by faith. That's true. That's from the Bible. That eternal hope that we have that when we die or if Christ should return while we're still in the flesh, we will then be with him forever. But there's the what about now stuff. And this is my third observation point. From the scripture, it answers that question. What what does faith mean now? Well, we live on by faith. Live on by faith. Faith is for every single moment of every single day. Now we, we know from Scripture, and I think we, we, we even sense this because of the holiness of God, right? We know from Scripture that it is God's desire for us that we would become like Christ in our character, moral character, right? But how does it happen? And I understand how, because of how I used to think about this, how many may still think about this. We know in our heads, okay, Jesus... Death on the cross paid for my sin. I know that God wants me to leave my sinful habits. I know he wants me to serve him now. But how is it that my life is going to change? What what has to happen? Does it just happen by trying harder or making some rules for myself? Maybe maybe I need someone to keep telling me to try harder and, and maybe make me feel a little bit guilty for not trying hard enough. This past week, or maybe it was another time, but I, I heard a, a sermon and the preacher likened this approach to what he called it Thursday night at youth camp. Well, if you've never been there, this is kind of how it goes because preaching gets really heavy on Thursday night because Friday you're going to go home, right? So Thursday night, you write your worst sin on a piece of paper and you promise God that you won't do it anymore and, and you nail it to a big cross. It's a great symbol, I understand or you throw it into the campfire at the end. But you think about it, that, that promise, that rule you just made for yourself, that, that confession, while well, confession is good for the soul, that doesn't have the power to change you, does it? In fact, I think about all the promises to God that I've made and how I have just failed to keep my promises to God. And really, when you do that, isn't that just another law? Another rule that you have to seem to 
keep. And that's not the gospel. And that's not living by faith. We live on by faith. Verse 17, if you look at it, it says this, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. From faith for faith. And I know that verse 17, there's some ambiguity there. It's, it's challenging. But you can see here that when you look down to verse 17, I think there's more clarification. But he says, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. And I take it that that means it is from faith in Christ as the object for everyday faith or from faith to faithfulness. Now, a little technical. Hang with me just because I feel compelled to prove this because you may not agree here, but I, I think the scripture shows us this. The last phrase in verse 17 says, the righteous shall live by faith. You can see it says that, right? You also see there that the Apostle Paul is quoting. He's, he's quoting from another part of Scripture because he says it is written, right? So that's where the ambiguity comes in because there's a footnote for that verse and that points you to Habakkuk 2 verse 4. And if you turn there to Habakkuk, you'll find a little ambiguity there too because it's the word faith, the righteous shall live by his faith, or does it say the righteous shall live by his faithfulness? Both are possible. Faith is chosen for the primary. Faithfulness is chosen for the footnote. Which is it? Now we understand the difference between faith and faithfulness, don't we? I think we get that, right? Faith means trust or belief. The word faithful means fidelity or trustworthiness. Now I'm, I'm convinced here that the Apostle Paul would certainly not undermine the truth that our salvation is secured by God's power and that our faith or trust is evidence of that. I don't think it undermined it. And I'm sure that he certainly would not be saying that we live by our ability to be faithful to God. We do not live by our ability to be faithful to God. But I think, I can find no other reason for this, or else it would be redundant from what he says in verse 16. I think he includes the quote from Habakkuk because the additional nuance, a meaning that it adds. The idea here is that the power of gospel believed, this is still a work of grace, produces faithfulness. It produces in our being made more like Christ in moral char character. It produces it. It isn't our work. It's not our faithfulness, but it results in our faithfulness. It's a grace-empowered obedience. So, I ask the question then, what are the implications of living on by faith? Or, state another way, how does living by faith impact your life right now? You might be thinking, I think about this all the time. But maybe you're thinking, what does, this, what does faith mean for my relationships? What does it mean for my marriage? For the way I am as a parent? What does faith mean for the, for the choices I make each day? The goals and the priorities I have in life? How I do my job? What job I do? How I spend my spare time? And what does faith mean in light of my persistent sinful cravings, the, the greed, the pride, and the lust. How do these go away? How do they get diminish, diminished over time? And, and how does faith come into play when, well, let's just face it, life gets really difficult or profoundly disappointing? Or when everything just literally seems to fall apart? How does faith come into play? And finally, how... How does faith come into play when I feel so inadequate or fearful, yet I know I need to serve the Lord? The gospel, which reveals the righteousness of God, brings the effect of faithfulness in those who are declared just, justified before God through faith. So Paul is not saying that our salvation through faith... I don't want to undermine this. Paul, Paul is not only saying that our salvation through faith justifies us, but that that faith is also the instrumental means by which we are sanctified. It still has the object on the gospel. We are sanctified, made holy by grace too. And what is our job as we live day to day? The thing that we need to continue to do over and over and over again is to trust, is to have faith. Now, I'm not saying we don't try to do things. We don't try to reorder our lives. But when we trust in the things we do, we're getting the order reversed. 
We live by faith. Here's what the Apostle Paul says to that. He's talking about those who remain in the body as others have gone to be with the Lord. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. That's an either or, isn't it? And to walk, what does that mean? It's really the same as to go about your life, doing what you do, fulfilling your responsibilities, serving God and your fellow man. That's walking. When we walk by faith, it means we go about our lives by faith in Christ as revealed in the gospel. This is a distinctly Christian way to live. And I would suggest to you it goes against our natural inclination. Our natural inclination is to believe that we are the masters of our own success and indeed our sanctification. And I'll remind you, to be sanctified is to be set apart by God. We don't so much set ourselves apart. God sets us apart for his purposes. And this happens by grace through faith. Now I understand this. We don't live day to day parsing our every move and action. That's why we must live by faith that's focused on the gospel. Reminded of what Christ has accomplished for us. And, and if perchance we let the gospel out of our sight, if we take our focus off of what Christ has accomplished for us at the cross, we can so easily fall back into the thinking that we can make ourselves faithful by our efforts alone. And that is what the Apostle Paul was dealing with with the Galatian church. They had heard the gospel, but they let it out of their sights and what happened? They fell back on the stuff they knew before, the way that they tried. And he says this to them. He's not being very nice here. If you read Galatians, he's, he's kind of unkind. But here he goes. He says, Oh, foolish Galatians. And we say, What are you, an idiot? I mean, that, that's how my, we might say it, but so that's the old language. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who put a spell on you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you, only this, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law, stuff you did, or by hearing with faith? Hits him again. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law? Or... By hearing with faith. Now, I'm pretty sure that not many of us in this room are in danger of falling into Jewish laws like ritual circumcision or kosher food laws. I don't think we're in danger of resting in those things. But we are always in danger of trusting in our own laws, our own tips, our own rules. Thinking that by them we get closer to God. Walking by faith may indeed be indistinguishable by, by observation in the actions of other people. We may not be able to tell because it's possible to do all of the right things. Reading your Bible, praying every day, you know, attending worship, giving generously, serving in the context of the local church. It is entirely possible to do those things thinking that somehow God is storing those up. And when we get before him, we go, hey, you got a good list. That's our natural inclination. And we can still do those things. But when we do them focused on Christ and the cross to say, He loved me and gave Himself for me. Oh, how I love to serve Him. Oh, how I want His priorities to be my priorities. Knowing that everything that God demands from us has already been given to us in Christ. And that our delight to serve and turn away from sin that's really a grace-empowered effort. Because we can't change our own affections, can we? You think about this. All of the things that you've ever done that you want to turn away from, have you ever got there by just saying, okay, I won't do that anymore? It doesn't work, does it? Because you can stop doing the external thing. I won't steal anymore. I'll stop lying. But if your heart is full, of envy and greed and a desire to deceive even if you don't do those things externally have you really accomplished anything 
No, we need somebody to change the heart. And the only one that can change the heart is the Spirit of God. And the only way, in our heart, the only way our heart is changed is when we come back to what Christ has done on the cross and to revel again in his glorious grace towards us. That's where the Apostle Paul can say something like this. Romans 14, 23. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. It's sin. See, that's how much faith matters. Faith is not a side issue. This is central to how we walk with God. And faith, in what the gospel tells us, faith in those facts about Jesus Christ and who he is and what he has accomplished, faith is the means through which we are justified made righteous before God. And faith in this same gospel is the means by which we are increasingly made like Christ over time. So how does this work? How does this work for for the things that we might encounter in life? First of all, if you're not a Christian, I'm going to say this to you, a little brief section for you. How does faith work? When you realize that God is holy and that you deserve to be condemned for your sin, Look to the cross. See what Christ has done to take all of that sin upon himself. Have faith. Believe that he did it for you and you will be saved. It is that simple. Now for believers, faith operating day to day. When you come under conviction by the Spirit and you recognize there's still sin in your life, and who doesn't, right? Who doesn't recognize that? And maybe you feel powerless to overcome it. What should you do? What should you do? Well, I would suggest don't make promises to God because you're not going to be able to keep them. How about this though? Have faith in God. Agree with him that his way is right. Confess the sin. Now, I'm not saying don't try not to do that. I'm not saying we don't try, okay? Don't, don't get that. But confess the sin and have faith in God that in the present, he is faithful and just to forgive. That's what the scripture says, 1 John 1, 9. He is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse from all that unrighteousness. Believe God. Look to the cross again and be reminded that you are righteous in Christ. So you confess your weakness and in fact you confess your inability to change yourself and you believe God that he will give you the grace that you need to overcome it. Keep trusting. Do not take your eyes off the cross. Now how about this? When you know God is prompting you to take some kind of step of obedience, okay? Okay? Maybe it's turning away from that destructive habit or or stepping out to serve him in the church. What do you do? Well, maybe you're fearful, but you believe God. You have the faith because of what he's accomplished at the cross. You have the faith that he will give you what you need to accomplish what God calls you to do. You look to the cross again. Be reminded from Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son, but what gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things, even the power to serve? Maybe when you're faced with that difficult decision, when you're not sure what, what's the best path to take, you, need, you don't know what to do. Well, you have faith in what God has said. He said he will give you wisdom without finding fault. That's James 1.5. Believe this. Trust him. And then be open to the way that he might reveal his wisdom to you. That maybe directly through the word of God, the scriptures, or maybe through a trusted Christian brother or sister. Well, how about when you face some kind of hardship, financial difficulties, health problems, when you're bereaved? What should you do? That's going to cover some people in this room this morning. Well, be reminded that Jesus said in the word, you will have tribulation. He already told you that. But then believe that God's word has said that God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted or tested beyond your ability. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Further, you can believe where God said, if he's asking you to walk through suffering or difficulty, he said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient. Now, there's any uh, number of other things that you might be facing. But our focus on the gospel is what causes us to endure through these things and even thrive. And why can we be confident in any of these things we find in Scripture? It's because of the gospel itself. When you hear the gospel again and again, it undermines, in a good way, your trust in yourself. 
When you hear the gospel, it undermines your trust in yourself and it aligns you again with what the real power is to change you, which is Christ himself. Now, to walk by faith, to live on by faith, it doesn't mean that by any stretch that we've arrived at perfection. It simply means that we are being made like Christ through God's grace and power. And to walk by faith is to live with the constant reminder of the gospel as the foundation to trust in all of the words of scripture. And I would suggest to you, at least this is true for me, it's why the gospel never gets old. It never gets old. Because it empowers us to live on by faith. One more verse of scripture. A brief comment. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Through faith alone, may we all look to Jesus. May we all be reminded of what he has accomplished for us at the cross as we continue to believe we can trust that he will steadily transform us into his image from one degree of glory to another and all for the glory of God. Amen.